I'm glad they don't. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Monday, February 12th Public Works and Finance Committee meeting. Um, please have a look at your agenda. We do have an amended agenda to get us started. We have approval of Public Works Finance <coughs> Committee January 22nd minutes. Did you all have? I, they look good. I would and to accept the minutes. Yeah, Second. we'll just accept them. That's good. Moving on to item two, disbursement report for January. Hi. Hi. All right, so looking at the expenditures for month end January 31st, um, total expenditures was $2,648,139. The largest expenditure is payroll, which came in at $1,018,654. There's a couple of other large payments that I'd like to note. We made our $500 payment to the city of Pullman for $500,000. Oh, sorry, $500,000. Yes, a little larger. <laughs> Um, for the airport realignment project. Um, we also had a booster station phase one contract payment for $169,354 and then a SCADA construction for $138,096. Those are probably our largest payments that I'd like to point out, but I did want you to note that on the disburs disbursement report for payables, you're going to see something different moving forward. We've always had the sections, it's this sheet right here, yeah. we've always had the sections broken out as just accounts payable. Uh -huh. But now because we've done something different with the credit cards, um, we have gone through Wells Fargo now and we're making a lot of our payments through them. That's an ACH payment that comes directly out of our Wells Fargo account. And so we're putting that on here. That's usually within the payables, but you'll notice that it's not anything there's no larger expenditures or more expenditures. It's just accounted for differently now. Okay. So. Okie Do you have any questions? Okay, mm -mm. then we can sign. All right. My mm. pen just ran out of ink, so hold on. I got it back up. And Brandy, I don't know if you noticed that there was a $15,000 contribution in donations, if that was something that you were wondering. But it was the library's portion of the par public art project for 13806 And then we had a $1,500 park bench donation that came in. Thank you. All right. Yep. We get to do item 3, 433 and 421 North Main Street lot line adjustment. Ryan's going to present. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. Hi there. All right, so before you on agenda item number 3 is 433. North Main Street for a lot line adjustment. Uh, the initial application came in through Shelley Bennett and she was actually requesting a uh, adjustment between two parcels of land currently addressed as 433 and 421 North Main Street in order to accommodate setbacks for a proposed building on one of her parcels. If I could direct your attention to the screen behind you, we can go through that. So this is a little bit of outdated photo, but it gives you a perspective looking southward on E Street. Uh, along you know, your left, you can see Main Street shows the, the unimproved parcel, uh, which is your subject property. A little bit of orientation. Uh, 421 North Main Street is our rose ours, and then 433 North Main Street is where, where the proposed uh, actions are to take place. Uh, the subject parcels located between Main Street and the intersection of E. And it's all zoned as motor business with some uh, remaining R4 further to the east. Here we have the application for the intent of the lot line adjustment. And essentially the, it's a boundary line adjustment on the southern parcel line of parcel one. Now it's uh, accounting for 180 linear feet and they're requesting to extend nine feet further to the south 
of the existing North Main Street uh, LLC's property. Uh, so from the original parcel size from North Main LLC is 4.828 acres down to 3.72. And the revision uh, of parcel one uh, is the overall expansion of 20,553 square feet. Part of that also includes the closing of one of the aprons um, to accommodate for that parcel. So you can see the hand sketched areas that indicate the nine foot uh, increase in size as well as the intent to abandon and close and improve with sidewalks on that. So again, this kind of shows a diagram of what the intention is for 433 North Main Street. Again, the existing parcel size was 18,834 square feet. Uh, to be adjusted to 20,553 square feet. Again, it's moving nine feet to the south. Again, Motor Business Zoning District, there's no minimum lot requirements and no minimum lot size. Uh, and there's, uh, based off of this application, uh, there's no proposed, or everything's meeting the proposed uh, size requirements for that. Our recommendation is to take public comment if applicable and recommend approval of the lodge adjustment request with no conditions. Anyone have questions? I do not. Yeah. No, I have no questions. I'm wondering uh, how, how the public comment, if applicable, how, do, how is that determined? Is that something that we're deciding right now? If, if okay. public comment is taken. Okay. And if you take it, then you apply it and make your decision based upon that. Yeah, and that's a decision for the full council to make? Yeah, we'll have a public hearing. Okay. Yeah. It's typical. But do we need to, um, do we have anybody that ha has any public comment here? Oh, thank you. You want to identify yourself since you popped up? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Shelly Bennett, 2279 Mosier Street in Moscow. Thanks. Okay. And thank you for... And the, the, nine, the reason why we're closing the entrance, there's three entrances that are being closed because part of our deal with the city was that there would only be two Main Street entrances when we were to get a building permit for any, either of those pads. Yeah. So then we have the two off of D&E and, e and then the two off Main. Yeah. So plus it helps with the... Mm -hmm. moving of cars through that yeah. project through the sonic yeah that's great All right thank you. thank you I don't think there's any questions from us here so then we'll just recommend to um, recommend to approve with a lot line adjustment without conditions yes. and this is where you take your public comment on that so as it goes to council it'll go with your recommendation your approval um, and do you want that on consent or do you want it on I think it's okay for consent. What do you? So you mean right now is where we take public comment on it? Yes. I'm sorry. You just so and there and yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> do you have a preference for consent or regular agenda? I see it as a consent. Me too. Yeah. Okay. So yes, please right. put it on consent agenda. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Item soon. number four, C Street, right away Thanks, vacation Ryan. and, and less. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. So today on the agenda, we actually have three right-of-way vacations, and all of them will have some similar characteristics in terms of process, and not everybody here has been through a vacation process. Uh, so just to give you a quick rundown on that, we re typically we receive an application from somebody that's interested in, in having the city vacate a portion of public right-of-way. Um, staff reviews that. We send out uh, notices to the franchise utilities of Vista and, and others like that. Uh, we review it from the perspective of any existing utilities we may have, that they may have, um, and then we go through a public uh, notice process. So it's posted um, in the paper in advance, and then generally speaking, we set a public hearing date. Uh, 
along the way we come to the committee to talk about the fact that it's coming but because we're doing an open public hearing and in front of the full council we generally don't provide a lot of information at this stage it's as much as anything to let you know it's um, anticipated that we've got a well we have scheduled the date it's confirmation of that public hearing date through committee and then essentially passing it on to council for the public hearing process okay. so in the three today um, this is the first one is the C Street Alley right-of-way vacation request and just to help uh, folks understand where it is this is C Street here on the northwest quadrant of the city uh, a Street running east-west here home Street and we've got this alley right through here that ties into another alley east-west. And the per area we're talking about is the very north 110 feet of that alley. Uh, just to give you an idea on the aerial, um, the folks that have made the request are on this property here at 807 East C Street. And they're requesting vacation of a very thin sliver on the east side of that 16-foot wide alley. So it's a pretty minor one in that respect. When we get to the public hearing, I'll go through a, a more detailed presentation on what's out there, uh, what could happen in the future, those kind of things uh, for consideration by the full council um, when they take public testimony. The address is supposed to be West C Street? That does say East C Street. It should be West C Street. That's correct. The voice from the audience um, <laughs> correcting us. So yes, mislabeled there should be West C Street. Could have been from above with that picture. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So then, since we have these three, we don't do them all three at the same time, though, because there's three separate items. Okay. So then we just need to decide um, to recommend. No, hold on. Confirm, Confirm the, the schedule. Okay. okay. So yeah, and the for the parent. February 20th meeting. Okay. okay. So what else? Mm -hmm, please. So it's a partial vacation then. Yes very small sliver on one side so it will leave it's a 20 foot wide alley now it's a 16 foot wide alley and wh how much alley will be left after the vacation uh, the request is for 1.17 feet of vacation so 14 and 80 300 so my math is right and you had a lot of pictures I think it'll be a good discussion just to f for understanding right of way and stuff right at the council meeting mm -hmm. Like I say, we'll go through a more detailed uh, mm -hmm. presentation at the council meeting for the entire council and for the, those that are there for the public hearing. Okay. So then we have this one set, so we're confirming that. Thank you. Okay. And then now Rayburn Street right-of-way vacation. I would note as well that when vacating Idaho Code 311, 50-311, uh, requires that it be expedient and in the public interest, and the council typically will vacate right-of-way, which is owned by the public, vacate it back to the adjacent properties presumably from where it came uh, or you can make a decision that it does not go back to those properties so it depends on what the request is the evidence is brought before you to go ahead and make that determination the city cannot obtain any uh, compensation for the vacation of a public right-of-way it is solely in the public's interest so if the council looks at it determines that it's in the public's interest to not vacate it then that should be the council's decision Typically, the council, I think, grants most of them uh, when they f make a specific finding that's in the public interest. I would also, for the Rayburn right-of-way, there was no draft ordinance in the packets for some reason. Correct? So we been. drafted one, yeah, it wasn't in there for some reason. Thank you. All the other two have them. Yeah, the other one. Okay. So you want to move on to Rayburn? Okay, so a similar story here, of course. Uh, another request that has come in, uh, in this case from uh, University of Idaho, is there the property owners on either side. And this is a situation where they've requested uh, that a section of Rayburn, which is right here, uh, be vacated. This is across the street from Wendy's. Actually, I did draw that in. Uh, so Wendy's uh, drive-through drive-in is right here and Rayburn used to go through uh, was removed some years ago uh, Related to this road being done and the creek going through so the university has uh, made the request that we consider vacation of that remaining slice of Rayburn Street right-of-way and again I've gone through the public uh, 
notification process. Uh, part of that, we send out uh, letters to folks within the property owners within 600 feet of these locations to make sure everybody's aware of it. And uh, again, advertised in the paper and put on the website. Okay. Yes, sir. Less the uh, new stadium way road, new, relatively new. Newer. Um, yes. Is not public right of way. It's that is all university owned. University property open to the public. That is correct. Okay. Whereas Rayburn is actually public right of way. That portion of it is yes, yes, and some of that was uh, that was actually acquired um, with the railroad um, mm -hmm. when they looked at pulling out some years ago yep. uh, through that process. And the reason you wanted to make that distinction. Well, public right of way is subject to the city's jurisdiction. If it is private property or university property open to the public, then the university has the ability to restrict movements on that property. They've left it open to the public. Perimeter Drive is the same way, mm -hmm. Nez Perce Drive. There's a lot of um, Line Street to the south of 6th Street is, right. um, used to be public right of way. It's been vacated now and it's under university ownership mm -hmm. and it's restricted access. So. The university could choose to restrict access on any of their property streets that are on their property that they own. Okay. So it's just we never had any issue with it. Just wanted to make sure that mm -hmm. this is public right of way that you're vacating, and the access now is along a privately held, even though institutionally held, that's open to the public. Okay, doke. Okay. So then, yes, we're going to confirm the scheduling of the public hearing on February 20th at the city council meeting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you and the third one is 1333 Landy Lane Lot Division. And you're doing that one? We can come back to that after the lot division discussion. Since we reach that point. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. Um, Landy Lane right of way vacation item seven, and then we'll come back up to six. No, that's not right. You're fine. We can keep them in order. Yeah, it should stay in the order. It's well, I was. Okay. Yeah, it had Ryan. <laughs> Sorry to confuse you. One. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. is it not going to be Ryan then? Um, should you be, the lot? Pre be presenting it? Presenting the lot division list? No. No, Ryan has done lot division. Okay. okay. So after the lot division then. will be the right of way and then the. Uh, yeah, it's somewhat of a sequential thing we're doing here. So okay. sorry about mm -hmm. the confusion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Hi again. Okay, so we are discussing the lane lot, the d the lot division for Landy Lane one three three three. Correct. There's okay. there's quite a few moving parts That's in this, good. and they're, they they happen in sequential order. So, uh, you know, we, we tried to develop a game plan that made the most sense, and yeah. so based off of the lot division request, you'll see further information in regards to vacation, as well as the the variance request going through too. So. Uh, from that point, this is the 1333 Landy Lane Lot Division. Uh, Tom Golis actually requested this lot division uh, to uh, establish four separate lots from the normally two platted along Christopher uh, Crossing Edition. So it's a little bit harder to locate Landy Lane. It's, it's actually situated between Hershey and Highland Drive. This is actually looking down the terminus of Landy as it stands today. Uh, this particular location is uh, terminated just by simply railroad ties and so forth, but the right of way actually continues further into the development of the property. From the area you can recognize a little bit better, we have Hershey Road to the north uh, and then Highland Drive to the south, and for reference, Orchard is actually on the right hand side of that property. The surrounding zoning uses, uh, this particular parcel and this request fall underneath R2 and the adjoining uh, land uses in the adjacent zones are farm ranch to the east uh, as well as suburban residential to the north, ag forest to the uh, to the west and then down to the southeast you can see some R1 residential single family. So here's the original uh, lots as developed uh, prior to a 2007 hearing. Uh, originally in 2007 there was a lot division request which where you saw some of these other parcels and these divisions happening uh, but after the approval of that particular hearing and that lot division re request 
there was no action taken there was no development and essentially the only thing that went through were the the separation for the three separate lots so here's where our two lots stand today in in relationship to the surrounding area and here we have the three separate lots from the 2007 time frame. So as you can see, there's two flag lots with a third lot on the east that shares access. Uh, the proposed modified cul-de-sac as approved from the, that, the time of the hearing and city council's recommendation. And you can see the existing right-of-way that's oriented in the dash line for the uh, traditional cul-de-sac. Uh, again, another talking point and another point that was uh, of primary concern from the council at the time was allowing pedestrian access to go from the terminus of Landy Lane to Hershey and uh, in the resulting parcel dimensions there's actually a small fragment of the property that's left trailing to the east of the cul-de-sac. So here's where it stands today. Uh, this is from the 2007 approved lot division request and as you can see, we actually have separation of uh, lots one and two to the west, a proportion of uh, the city right-of-way that was dedicated for the modified cul-de-sac and the approved par parcel of, well, it did not necessarily named lot three, but it was a remnant of, of the adjoining lots there. So again, this is the application for Landy Lane uh, on behalf of Hodge and Associates uh, who filed for the, the request for the lot division. Again, there's a, a request for a total of four separate lots, two of which are flag lots, uh, which conform to the current city requirements. And it also includes the modification to the pedestrian access, which in, is incorporating a 15 foot wide pedestrian easement and then a vacation of the right of way and a, a modification of that particular right of way to accommodate for a variance on a um, uh, hammerhead type turnaround rather than the cul-de-sac. So this is part of the application material that the, that the uh, applicant actually submitted which indicates the three lots to the west. The private drive and then the areas in bold you can see at the terminus where the, the proposed hammerhead will be developed. Uh, that's actually the modified city right-of-way and the vacation of the right-of-way which we can see right here uh, the vacation actually allows for the full development of a fourth lot, which was prohibitive in the previous requests. The, another note is the with those modifications, we actually have a 15-foot pedestrian right-of-way that bisects parcel three and parcel four, and then follows from the uh, the north to a westerly fashion in order to connect to Hershey. So here's the the parcel sizes, which indicate the the need and the fact that they've remained and are still conformance to our current requirement. Uh, parcel 1 is slated to be uh, developed as a 13,767 square foot parcel. Parcel 2 is 10,271 square feet. Parcel 3, 8,381 square feet. And parcel 4 includes a 10,299 square foot parcel. This is broken down into the pedestrian easement. Again, this is from the original 2007 approved uh, lot division request. And so we, you can see the, ex the proposed uh, two flag lots and then the modified public right-of-way or the modified cul-de-sac with a public right-of-way incorporated and the remnant. Uh, so essentially our pedestrian access still continues from the terminus of Landy, but it's actually through the public right-of-way and then the pedestrian easement for the right-of-way dedication on to the private property, which is considered city right-of-way after the approval. So that's from the 2007, going rolling into the 2018 proposed application. Uh, again, we're still retaining all of our, our lot sizes, but the brown indicates the proposed vacation of the right-of-way, and then the proposed modified public right-of-way to accommodate the hammerhead. And then, as you can see, we picked up a little bit of a north-south um, uh, easement between uh, parcels three and four, which incorporate the pedestrian easement as well. Again, R2 zoning district, the minimum lot width is 60, 60 feet for single family. The minimum lot area is 7,000 square feet for single family dwellings. Uh, important note about flag lots, the abutting public street right away uh, is a 20 foot minimum. And then the flagpole portion of the lots should not exceed 150 square 150 feet in length, no less than 20 feet in width, and all, all proposed lots meet the minimum lot requirements. 
our recommendation from staff is take public comment if applicable and recommend approval of the lot division request with the following conditions. The vacation of the right of way and engineering variants are approved. Dedication of additional right of way is made and a deed of dedication is made for the 15, wide, 15 foot wide pedestrian easements between lots three and four. And all public improvements are constructed including the pedestrian walk or the developer enters into a developmental agreement and security is posted to secure such improvements prior to any building permits being issued upon the subject property. Any questions from you? Yeah, I, I do have questions. I need to, to say I live on Highland, so oh, um, so it's helpful. So um, the modified, the hammerhead, is dealing with the fire department's requirements. So would you like to discuss that a little more? I, I can discuss in limited fashion, but it's going to be further talk on Les's proposal as well. Uh -huh. um, so, so the city requirement is for a 96-foot cul-de-sac. And so there's a requirement for a variance that needs to take place prior to any kind of modification to that. And so the, the hammerhead style uh, allows them to develop a fourth lot, and that's part of that proposal. I, I, I'm not sure what, if, if that's kind of the information that you're looking for, or do you need further I clarification just feel like on it? No, I think, I think it's an interesting solution. Yeah. I just wanted to, um, I know, especially when you look at all the notes and stuff for the mm -hmm. previous years, the concerns with the cul-de-sacs and the turnaround. So it's just getting clarification on how the hammerhead shape addresses the concerns for the fire department got you uh well as far as comment we had no no uh, pressing comment uh, during the review period for the initial application from the fire department okay. uh, so I, I haven't shared any concerns with us in that app in that regards um, beyond the the legal descriptions coming from engineering uh, all of the departments approved this uh, overall with no no further comment on it yeah, I had only had one comment. It was from a neighbor, and it, it was trying to understand the pedestrian easement piece. And I think they were just wanted to make sure it was maintained, and you show that it clearly is. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I do have a follow up. Mm -hmm. sure, so yeah. just so I'm clear, we do have we do have the fire department's okay on the hammerhead design. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the further details will come from the, the variance request that's proposed to go through too, so Les will have further information on that. Um, the, the, the biggest detail is, f for this particular action item, for us anyway, is the division of the four separate lots, and then uh, all of that is contingent upon the variance and the right-of-way vacations and so forth. So all those, that, that whole, whole wall of conditions are related to, if, if none of those are, are met, then the lot division and I know that unit. just since I've been on council there was a lot of conversation about the flagpole lots and I think people are concerned that in some way that um, someone trying to access that back lot mm -hmm. would be an issue um do do the widths change on the flagpole each flagpole width can accommodate wider and narrow as long as it meets the minimum mm -hmm. um, and so what they've proposed on this section here uh, you can see that portion of so that bold line is actually where the proposed city right-of-way will occur mm -hmm. um, by coming further into the, uh, underneath parcel 3 it allows them to reduce the requirement of that flagpole length and based off the proposal it appears there's a, a common private uh, road that the is shared between parcels 1 and 2 um, but beyond that, it still meets the minimum requirements for our flag lots. Okay, thank you. Hmm. All right, so do you have any, no? any other questions? Nothing more, nothing. And then now we just, um, we're going to recommend approval of the lot re division request with the conditions that you stated. And then we move on to the variance. I, I would like to add that uh, we do have some public feedback that for oh, yeah. some uh, folks that weren't able to make it. So if, if we may, okay. So th as far as the, the written confirmations, we had a comment from Dennis Fullerton at 1510 Orchard Avenue. And he came in after receiving the public notice and stated that there's no objectives. Uh, and he stated that's probably, probably the best use of the property. Uh, beyond that, there there was several people that actually came into our office too to to get the feel of what's going on within the neighborhood. But I don't know if there's other public comment that may or may not want to take place for this. But um, 
that's the only one that we have on record too. Okay. Is there somebody out there? Did you want to come up and introduce yourself? And I'm Jill Rinaldi. You have to come up. You got to come to the microphone. Hello. I'm Jill Rinaldi, and I live at 943 Hershey. And I was wondering, um, on the sidewalk that uh, connects Hershey to the proposed uh, development, um, how is that angulated? As far as the connection from Hershey yeah. to the How is the current sidewalk going to be connected to the new proposed development? So as you can see up here, it's, it's well, the line weight's very difficult for you to read. But from here, this is where the proposed improvements are going to be from uh, the south end of the property all the way up to Hershey. So the, the, the terminus for this improvement actually stops right there to the property line. That's as far as they'd be required to continue for their pedestrian access. So is it going to meet the existing sidewalk? If, if the, is it, the existing sidewalk is further north of, of this particular location? Correct. From the new development, there is a sidewalk that connects to Hershey Road. So the existing uh, sidewalk that comes from Hershey Road that was part of the Christopher's Crossing subdivision comes from the north right about here. And that Hershey is off the screen uh, to the top, but there is a sidewalk that comes from Hershey to this property line at this point. Uh, maybe it's right there. And this easement that's already in place picks up from the end of that and carries us to the east. And then the new easement here that would be um, dedicated as part of the conditions would take it from that point down to this reconfigured street right of way. So the west end of this section will connect to that existing walk that comes from Hershey. Then they would continue construction of that walk from there down to the street section. Because the new one that you're proposing to the development's a lot wider than the existing one. The current sidewalk standard is five feet, and the old sidewalk standard was four uh, in terms of the actual physical uh, walk itself. The easement may actually be wider as well. I think it's a 15-foot easement Yeah, here. it said 15 foot, so foot it's, like yeah, right. I said, it's a lot yeah. different. Yeah, the easement itself is, is certainly wider than what it was back in the original plant. So who uh, is responsible for the original sidewalk between Hershey and this development? Typically, our parks department deals with uh, walks, uh, public walks that pass through between lots um, that are in subdivisions like this. Uh, they, they normally address those. Um, I know it's not necessarily always a consistent thing, um, <laughs> but generally speaking, I think that's, I haven't seen that's, them yet. Been, that's been the <laughs> approach. Um, it, it, yeah. I mean, sure. walks in front of homes are the responsibility of that adjacent sure. property owner. When we have pass-throughs, it gets a little gray, um, but I think generally that's been the way they've been addressed is through the Parks Department. So there's a lot of traffic through there. Mm -hmm. It's popular. Yes, Gary. The code is that uh, sidewalks adjacent to properties are the responsibility of the property owner. We have in cases where you do have these sorts of things that is more of a neighborhood pathway. Uh, there's no responsibility for a property owner to clear a pathway, for instance, the yeah. Paradise Path. Um, so. It probably has not been done consistently, but it's just a matter of manpower at that point. Many places just chain off the sure. pathways in the winter mm -hmm. and advise people not to use them. So it's just a matter of how, how much you can maintain. Where would the lighting be on uh, the, that four parcel if indeed that's approved, a street light? Our standard um, in our adopted street standards uh, generally puts street lights uh, at intersections, or dead ends, or uh, more severe curves. Uh, I don't know if this plan calls for a specific location for a light yet, but typically it would be somewhere, um, you know, one of these quadrants, if you will, uh, around the hammerhead itself. Something generally in, in those locations to light this portion. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like there's no other further comment or response.
responses. So then um, this one, um, so then again, we'll recommend approval of the lot division request with the conditions um, that the vacation of right of way and engineering variants are approved with all the conditions that you stated. Yes? Hmm. Okay. And this will come to regular agenda because it's contingent upon those other factors being approved. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Okay. Item seven, Landy Lane, right of way vacation. you know what I'm going to say here. <laughs> uh, this would be the, the third right-of-way vacation request that we've had and, and as uh, was just laid out in the lot division process. Uh, this is one that's um, a little different from the perspective of ultimately what the council decides with respect to this lot division um, will have some potential other consequences on, on the lot division process. Uh, as a condition of that lot division, if for some reason um, the vacation does not proceed, then that lot division essentially falls apart. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, you've seen the maps, but generally we're talking this, this same neighborhood, uh, same location we just discussed at the end of Landy Lane. Um, and that is the shape of the uh, right-of-way portion that is being requested for vacation uh, from that uh, 2000, I think it was seven or 2009 time frame, seven. big piece that we had, 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, so if this is vacated, then what we end up with is this kind of rectangle right here. And then as part of the conditions, um, then they would dedicate additional over here on the west side to complete that hammerhead shape. So that is the vacation request, what's shown in yellow, again, advertised um, and letters sent out to property owners within 600 feet for a public hearing on the 20th. Yes. It is a process. Okay, and do you have any questions is, further about? Is that the sidewalk that we can see? There it is, the right there. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what yeah. is there right now. There's so a that's fence and that's where we that we have it. we have the easement that starts right in there, and it would run over, and then down roughly in here and tie into that new right. Yeah. I'm glad to see them figuring out something. It seems like they've tried really hard to, to figure out what to do with this piece of property. So in this mm -hmm. case, um, do you have any questions, Gina? No. Nope. Randy? Okay, then we can uh, recommend approval of the variance request to build a permanent type three turnaround per, nope, I'm one more down, sorry. Yep. Confirm the scheduling of the public hearing on the matter of the Landy Lane right of way vacation on okay. February 20th. Now item eight, still dealing with Landy Lane. This is the cul-de-sac variance request. Bob, how do you say your last name? Bell. Bouvel? Yep. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm up here to talk about the variance request for the cul-de-sac turnaround at the end of Landy Lane. Um, what I what I have shown up here is is the, the standard construction drawing. This is the standard turnaround that we normally require at the uh, at a de dead end in a uh, in a subdivision, which has a, a kind of an effective footprint of about. Uh, a hundred foot diameter cul-de-sac turnaround. Uh, this is a picture of was taken today actually of what the end of Landy Lane looks like. Um, so from the end of that railroad tie down to there is about 25 feet to give you a perspective of scale. So if you try to imagine trying to get a 100 foot circle to fit at the end of this property, it's, it would create a lot of earthwork, um, would make a big impact on the area. And to kind of further that point, there's a 100 foot circle inside the existing right of way that we currently have. So um, kind of gives you another perspective of, of the impact that that turnaround would have. On, on what they're trying to do with this development. So what they 
what they have requested is a, is a variance to be able to essentially install a type three turnaround, which is this one right here, uh, the shape and dimensions of which come pretty much directly from the fire code. So we take the, the dimensions and, and, and uh, shape from the fire code and, and basically made our, our standards meet that. Um, so that's kind of the idea is, is it's definitely not the preferred method for a turnaround for fire trucks and other the public and all that but in some extenuating cases we we this is this is for this standard drawing is for a, a temporary turnaround that we would put at the end of a uh, uh, at the end of a phase of a subdivision or um, maybe in a in a commercial development that that would have that would be phased and you wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't complete the full turnaround. So the, um, you know, the markings on this one say it's from, the one we have in our packet says it's from May of 14. So the standards yes. are the same then? They haven't changed? Uh, no, the, the standards have not changed since 14. Will this be one of the first ones in town? Do we have other ones? As far as a, for a hammer, a permanent hammerhead turnaround. To my knowledge, we do not have any permanent hammerhead turnarounds. Um, we do have a, we do have a temporary one at the end of Sunnyside, that's that's done in a in um, at the south end of Sunnyside, over in off of Blue River Drive. Yeah, I think we actually do have a couple. Um, they haven't been installed for quite some time, and uh, we phased out the alternatives to a standard cul-de-sac in, I don't know if it was the 2014 or even prior to that in the 20, I think 12 um, set of adopted standards. Uh, the preference, as Bob says, is for a, a cul-de-sac um, just for a lot of different reasons and you know, not the least amongst them is snow removal. Uh, it's a little more challenging with a, with a hammerhead as compared to a cul-de-sac. Uh, but in this particular situation, uh, this property has been looked at so many times and trying to find ways to make it work uh, to allow it to you know, go to a different use than sitting fallow. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the hammerhead option that will meet the turnaround requirements for the fire department and what they're proposing is actually even slightly bigger than that mm -hmm. um, seemed like a pretty viable alternative in this case. And that's why staff has been supporting the, uh, the variance uh, for this particular public turnaround. No, I was glad to see um, something trying to adapt because looking through all the notes of how long this has been mm -hmm. back and forth trying to figure out what to do with this. So do you all have any questions or anything you want to comment? So, so it looks like this has already been um, noticed for comment. Is that this is not a variance under the Lo Local Land Use Planning Act. This is just a variance from the adopted street standards, which are, which are adopted through resolution of the council. Oh, yeah, okay. So variance is in its lowercase term varying from the standard, okay, yeah. not a land variance. use variance right. as defined by the Local Land Use Planning Act. So really what you're doing in the context of the entire proposal is just determining, as I said, it's a sequential deal where if you're not going to approve this, then the design doesn't work. You don't need the lot division. You don't need to vacate the right of way. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for your, um, I guess, recommendations. So as we go to council, we'll try to bundle these together mm -hmm. so that they're a little more, um, they'll still be in the same sequence, but hopefully it'll be one package mm -hmm. as it comes forward. And then, yeah, just to uh, kind of finish the, the the presentation out is a is a more close up drawing what the the of how that hammerhead turnaround would fit within the within what the infrastructure that they're proposing to build. And I should note here, just as a point of interest, uh, you'll see the 28 foot wide section there to the north. Um, we do allow a 28 foot wide street under the current standards. When it is a dead end, typically a block or or, you know, or two blocks at most, uh, that's not anticipated to ever extend further, and that would be the case here. So the 28 foot width is appropriate in this case. So our our staff's recommendation is to uh, approve the variance to to allow a type three turnaround as opposed to the uh, 
to the standard cul-de-sac. Yep. And, and yeah, I mean, I know you asked this before, but I just want to make sure so yeah. that the fire department is aware of this or, and yeah. Okay. And, and again, are the shapes of the, the shapes of those, uh, of those temporary turnarounds have been taken almost directly from fire code to match mm -hmm. what they, what they have deemed necessary to get a fire truck turned around. Good. Let me go back to the. So then we will get to um, recommend approval of the variance request, lowercase v, um, to build permanent type 3 turnaround per standard construction drawing number 5. All right. Thank you. All right. There are no other items on our agenda unless, Gary, you have anything. No, ma'am. I have nothing for you. All right. And with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you.